So the first one that I want to introduce, Stephen Kalman. Stephen is going to do multiverse learning. Stephen has been a classroom teacher for 25 years, and he's the current director of the Council on 21st Century Learning. And this exciting story is a story of learning, in particular the learning in the last 30 years that has been conducted by physicists and astronomers, and which they've been learning to rethink the very nature of existence which is, in my mind, kind of big. So we're not just talking about human existence. We're, not just, we're talking about all existence. Astronomers, physicists are rethinking it. So here's the story. Uh, but let me set the story in a little context, which is that there's this kind of party game that I like to play. I can't get any of my friends to do it, but you might be able to persuade some of yours, which is the game of new knowledge since 1970. It's, I'm sure there's going to be an app soon, and you can share it with friends. What the game is, is to think about brand new ideas or inventions or things, concepts, information that's been discovered since about 1970. I, that's kind of arbitrary, except that it's sometime around the time that I graduated from high school. We're not going to say how close. And we'll take a look. Can, can you see in the back, can you see the individual words? So, at least the larger ones. Take a look for a minute to see if some of these kind of jump out at you. New knowledge. Anybody see anything that just, just go, oh, yeah, that. Anybody? Hmm? Sticky notes. That's one of my favorites. Like, how did we ever get along before that? Anybody else? I'm sorry? The geo map. Oh, yeah. Why, why did that jump out for you? Uh, the historical connection. It to, to be able to go back in time by going around in places. Anybody else? Gore-Tex. Gore-Tex, another one that's my favorite. I used to be a big-time backpacker. Cell phones. Cell phones. <laughs> yeah, another that's a favorite of mine is hybrid engines. You know, I read an article about 20 years ago in the Atlantic Monthly in which uh, uh, the writer was saying, hybrid engines, right around the corner. And uh, we'll be able to go 50 miles to a gallon of gasoline. And letters came pouring in. You are so crazy. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Anyway, it's interesting. So I like to collect this stuff. I think it's fascinating and it tells a lot. You know, yuppies. Uh, how we learn, which we'll come back to, PTSD. So, you know, it's not all great, but it's fascinating to think about stuff that 30, 40 years ago did not exist. Last year at this uh, conference, I talked about a couple of pieces of new knowledge that are our, favorite, our favorites of mine, fractals and chaos. I won't belabor them again, but fractals, fascinating kind of piece of new knowledge that, that measures irregular, measures and describes irregular shapes. So a, a universe or a galaxy or broccoli or seacoats. In fact, uh, the inventor of fractals, Benoit Mandelbrot, I mean, this is a kind of mathematics. It didn't exist until Mandelbrot in the 70s said, oh, fractals. And the first question that he posed publicly anyway, was how do you measure the circumference of England? And his answer was, well, it depends on how far away you are when you're looking at the circumference. If you're 5,000 feet in the air, it's one answer. If you're down in the sand with a magnifying glass, it's a different answer because of the degree of irregularity. But he found equations, formulas, that could predict and describe those kinds of irregular shapes. It fascinates me. Another one is chaos which is not, as we typically think about it, unbridled disorder, but is a particular kind of order in a vast system in which tiny little changes of input will create vast changes of output in that system. And the classic example is the butterfly wings flapping in one part of the world that cause a hurricane in another part of the world. I mean, these are fascinating pieces of new knowledge. Oh, and this is also my opportunity to say, by the way, I'm not a math and science guy. 
These just happen to be big ideas that I find totally fascinating. And another advantage of talking about big ideas in math and science is that very few people in an audience of librarians and teachers will get up and go, <laughs> you are so wrong. So thank you for not doing that. Here's the story I want to tell about the physicists and the astronomers. Because there was this time, according to the article that I read, when physicists kind of thought they had it all figured out. Like they knew the nature of existence. That's big. The, uh, the way it was written, it, they, they were, there were these four basic forces. I think they're electromagnetism, gravity, radioactivity, and nuclear bonding, those forces. And they pretty much had them all described, except gravity, interestingly. And they just needed to sort out a few more parameters, maybe a couple of dozen. And this was in the 1970s. And they were going to be able to describe in one, and they called it the theory of everything, in one great theory, they were going to be able to describe all existence. Well, of course, this, like any myth, any really good myth, no, no sooner did they get there than things started to fall apart. One of the first things that caused it to fall apart was a, th was a thing called Big Bang inflation, which was an amendment to the original Big Bang theory, you know, itself a new idea in the 1920s, that existence didn't exist, and then all of a sudden it went and existed. <laughs> which is a kind of a fun notion anyway. Well, so I don't know if you can see this clearly, but the inflation theory is based on observations made by satellites from NASA that discovered that in the first trillion, 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 trillionth of a second of the Big Bang. Now, let's not even get into it. How do they make measurements like this? But they found that in the first trillion, 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 trillionth of a second, the Big Bang accelerated. It was not only Big Bang, but it was Bigger Bang. And, then, and all the scientists were like, oh my God, how'd this happen? Well, first of all, how do you even, well, forget it. Anyway, it's kind of fascinating just as a timeline thing, you know. Here down at the bottom is the uh, universe, 13.7 billion years old. I, you got to admire the 0.7. Like, n we're not talking 14 billion years. We don't, we don't estimate in science. 13.7 billion years old. And there was a period of about 500 million years when there was really nothing except just, you know, fluctuating cosmos. And then finally we got some galaxies. You know, like our galaxy doesn't even come into play until, you know, 10 billion years ago. And our, and our solar system doesn't even come into play until about 5 billion years ago. And, but anyway, back in this first, five, first trillionth of a second, suddenly there's this acceleration. Well, how do you explain it? Well, so a theory came up that said, oh, there's like some energy that suddenly gets injected into the Big Bang. And the scientists loved that explanation because this new energy that got injected into the Big Bang explained a whole bunch of stuff. And they were all like, please. And then somebody said, oh yeah, but where'd this energy come from? Oh, mm, problem. Okay, problem. First problem. Another problem. There's a theory called string theory. Probably familiar to everybody. Uh, String theory, which was again proposed in the 1970s, and ironically, was proposed initially because it was going to be the foundation for this theory of everything. It was going to pull all the forces together. String theory, the basic stuff of existence, says string theory, is not like tiny, 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 tiny particles, but is these little one-dimensional strings. The strings vibrate, kind of like a violin string. The basic vibrations of these strings cause the elder elements to exist. Okay, fascinating. But problem with string theory is, once again, it leads to the projection that, oh, we don't have one universe. We have many universes. Shift to the 1990s. In fact, 1998. Astronomers, again, those pesky satellites, found these measurements that said, oh, the Big Bang is getting faster in the last 10 million, 5 million, billion years or so. So 
Big Bang Theory, would, even with inflation, would predict that as the Big Bang keeps going through the billions of years, it would slow down because gravity is trying to pull everything back together. That all made sense, except actual measurements discovered that in the last five billion or so, the Big Bang's actually accelerating. And instead of like going, uh, and then it's going to come back, it's who knows how far it's going to go out because it's expanding faster than it should be. So scientists, I love that they come up with this stuff in all their precision. They said, well, that's because there's all this dark energy. It's invisible, but it's out there. And based on the rate of acceleration, they've decided that this dark energy makes up three-fourths of all the stuff in existence. This is brand new. This is in the last decade or so. They suddenly completely changed their formulation. I think that's kind of cool. And again, the problem with this really interesting theory is that it predicts not just one universe, but many. So the, here we have the multiverse. So all the latest theories in astronomy and physics are now starting to say, oh, we don't live in the universe. We live in a universe that is one of many. Well, if you're a science fiction fan, and I am, you read about that kind of stuff. But now this is not science fiction. This is science theory. Physicists and astronomers are going, oh, there's infinitely possible universes, and not only possible, existing. We don't know about the others. We only know about this one. Does that interest you? I mean, is that kind of fascinating to me? It's like the nature of existence, as we've understood it, is completely different, potentially, from the way we understand it. And we've just thought about that in the last few years. You might be thinking, <laughs> what is the point, Stephen? And I'm glad you asked. Because, remember I said, this is really a story about learning. So here's my theory of learning, based not just on this story, but on other stories like it, and things that we need to think about. My theory is that knowledge is an energy field, not an object. An energy field. It's like fluid, dynamic, always shifting and moving, that it's kind of restless, that it's chaotic in the sense that the scientists talk about it. Not an object that we grasp. It's not like, as we tend to think about it, you know, a brick. And we got this brick, and then we lay another one in. It's an energy field. Entertain this notion for just a moment. Here's some implications to me. First, it means we need to really think about what we mean when we say we construct knowledge. So cognitive science has been telling us for the last half century, of course school hasn't found that out yet, that we learn by constructing knowledge in our neural networks. School still thinks that teachers can push knowledge into reluctant brains. But cognitive science has rejected that for a long time and says, no, knowledge is internally built based on all kinds of factors in a network structure. Now, construction is an interesting word to use because, again, construction would suggest the bricks. Oh, we laid the bricks on top of each other. You build walls, chambers. Pretty soon you got this storehouse of knowledge, maybe a library. Who knows? But the way in which cognitive science is really talking about the construction, it's not a construction of bricks, but a construction of continually weaving, interlocking, dynamic, always changing networks, neural networks, energy networks. So here's another thought. If knowledge is an energy field, then learning is about exploring that energy field. I don't know, you may be familiar with the hero's journey first proposed by Joseph Campbell in what, in what he describes as the monomyth. Many 
years ago. He talked about how the hero is called to the journey and sets forth fearfully but courageously, battles the fierce dragons or whatever the foe are, uh, confers with allies, hears the gods, gets the treasure, comes back, and then the hero gets another call to another journey. Like inquiry, learning is exploration of this energy field and you never stop. If knowledge is an energy field, learning is a dance. Not a stationary position, but a continual, rhythmic, chaotic movement responding to partners, to the environment, to the surround of sound and energy. And it, these thoughts to me suggest learning in a completely different way from the ways we are supposed to think about it as teachers. We do this, no. Learning is exploration. It's internal construction. It's a dance. And one other, learning is flow. Probably a lot of folks are familiar with the flow theories of Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. I've been practicing. But his flow theories, if you're not familiar, I really recommend you read up on them because they're totally interesting, suggest that there's this fine-tuned state that we enter at certain times where we are completely absorbed in an activity, lose our self-consciousness, and just do, and then perform at our highest capabilities, an athlete in the zone, or a dancer who is becoming the choreography. Or, interestingly, a kid playing games. Video games, working your way through the levels, often create flow experience. We don't often see it in classrooms. And another interesting piece on flow is that you always have to balance challenge and skill. If you have too much challenge relative to the skill, you have anxiety. If you have too much skill relative to the challenge, you have boredom. So there's this dynamic interchange always going on as the flow moves up through levels of challenge and skill. If knowledge is an energy field, learning is flow. So I'm going to ask you to consider this theory of mine and look at these as the standards that we might strive to achieve. Because I think that if we were learning the skills, the self-assessments, the values, the habits of mind of constructing, exploring, dancing, flowing in the energy field of knowledge, we wouldn't have to worry about the other stuff. We'd be taking care of it. We would be embracing the multiverse of learning. Thanks. <laughs>